The Sporland Division of Parker Hannifin Corporation is sponsoring this podcast. Sporland is the leading manufacturer of HVAC and R components. Using quality materials and craftsmanship, Sporland maintains a commitment to innovation, manufacturing excellence, service, and support for its customers since 1934. The company is known for its catch-all filter dryers, thermostatic expansion valves, solenoid valves, pressure regulating valves, suction filters, electric valves, controllers, supermarket monitoring solutions, chemicals, smart service tools, ZoomLock Max Press to Connect, and ZoomLock Push, Push to Connect Refrigerant Fittings. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to Sporland.com. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. We've all been there in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporland, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration, Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc. has all your solutions down cold. Stop it. <laughs> no, keep going with your story. Well, the whole... <laughs> You're so dumb. All right. Well, I'm glad you got a hotel, though. Yeah. No, it's apparently there's like some investor meeting. They got, there are investor meetings going on down there. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. I don't remember. I was gonna say something, and then I just totally spaced. What do you? What do you? Where? Where? What do you do? Well, I'm doing case drains because I'm the best apprentice there is right now. Still? Oh yeah, like I'm 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 rocking out case drains. I, I I've moved from from entry level apprentice to like mid level apprentice. Move so, out. Yeah, no, I just want to beat my head against the wall like doing these case drains every time. It's just the most miserable thing in the world. When are you gonna do a evaporator like hanging evaporator drains? You gonna do that soon? No, no, I only get to do the drains like underneath the case where like you look, it looks like Edward Scissorhands cut you up, up up afterwards. Yeah, yeah. No, it, actually, we're we're putting a bunch of cases in right now, so like it's just like w whatever you can get done and but without people running you over shopping carts because we're doing it in the middle of a on, on a holiday week in a busy store and like people just see caution tape and they're like Ram shopping cart, like. It, it honestly probably makes more people come to the caution tape, seeing the caution tape. I'm convinced. <laughs> if they would just block it off and sell it just the caution tape. Or just no caution tape. If you had no caution tape, there are people like, just ignore it. Like, you yeah. should put phones up. They're just like, I'm going to go right here. <laughs> I mean, there's too many safeties anymore. Well, yeah. I mean, change of pace. 
Yeah, it's probably not a good idea, but yeah. I went to the office today. I had a meeting. I met a I met a gentleman that I've been talking to for a minute. He uh, he has some kind of box that has a heater that controls the temp or te- the, the, the relative humidity underneath the uh, underneath the cases, and he has numbers that show the fact that it clears up usually within like any water on the on the floor from underneath from like just the insulation degrading after a while just he's manipulating the dew point to make the hot air because when you have cold air underneath there it doesn't hold as much moisture right hot air holds more moisture so you, you're expelling more more air or i'm sorry water when you're when you're moving that heat around when you're heating like the water up and stuff there's a little ceramic heater in there two little fans it controls the the relative humidity underneath there and they've had i mean there's old stores that they're like yeah they're leaking at the case seems we'll, we'll, we'll get them when they're changed when they when they get changed out and it's fast forward they're 15 years old and they're like no they're staying there for a couple more years so if you you know as well as i do a lot of times you move a lineup that's older than 10 years old and you happen to shift it just a little bit too hard now you got a whole bunch of other leaks on other cases so what he was explaining to me is that it drives up any everything from underneath and causes it you actually isolate and find where your leak is so sometimes it's just a bitch plus it actually heats up the insulation so it it, it, it helps kind of dry that out as well so I, i'm going to be doing some tests on that and we're going to see how well that works he has a couple in some of our stores already but i'm going to take i'm going to take this one down to the training center and shoot some video and see how it, i want to do a time lapse video so you can actually see like the how much water is disappearing within x amount of time you know what i mean I'm going to fix the case. Yeah, but it not a lot of couple. You, you know how it is. The customers are like, nah, yeah, we'll fix it later. 47 service calls and 18 slip and falls later. They could have changed the case. Four and, times. I, and I agree with you. And I am totally agreeing. So this gives them an out. So they don't have to invest that kind of money. Even though I think they should, but whatever. Yeah. So, so what, were you, what were you working on yesterday? Because I think that's going to lead us into what we're talking about. This week, I want to go over what I call calm catastrophes and how to find and avoid them. So what what I'm talking about this time is, so we had a store, a big box store running case controllers, and they've had like nonstop calm issues ever since this remodel was done. Like they, they're on their second contractor. They've had nonstop. They've had everybody in in the store. So from day one, the store was not done right. The com loops weren't done right. Everything stars? was stars. Right. Stars. Stars. There's so, some stars. Some improper wiring on like Dixel stuff where the lands involved in the RS forty five. Wire nuts. Wire nuts on the no. com. There's a few like that's that's the least, that's the least of the worries. Oh, I use it. Like I get yelled, I get yelled at for using the little uh, jelly beans. The, the 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 I use gel caps all the time with com lines. Well, I I see. I don't like the dolphin connectors, but I, I like the gel caps. The, the ones that are clear, the 3M. Not the other ones you get at Home Depot. Like it's like the not. It's got to be the 3M UR2 sky yes. block. Yes, where it actually has three. You can fit three 18 gauge wires in there, and then that's the other reason why I like using it because you can actually do. When you're calming together like Belimo valves, uh, Belimo valves, you know, the ones that take zero to 10 volt, you can actually hook the three wires to it, the ground from the signal, the ground from the actual unit. And then, you know, you, and you have that extra one that you can hook up to the actual ground back controller. So I like them to get twisted together and put it in there. Usually you could usually switch to, you could fit two 22 twos in there in one slot twisted together. Are you, oh, I see what you're saying. It's like I'll twist the and when I if I use a UR2 connector, like I'll twist the the, the 22 twos together for a com line. I'll put them in the same port and then crimp them down. So that way they're twisted together, they're crimped, and they're not coming apart. Yeah. Don't use wire nuts. Wire nuts bad. No, I'm not a fan of dolphins. Like the electricians have been using them a lot lately because they can't get the UR2 connectors. Because the only place you can get them, I can find them now is Amazon. Yeah, they I I have had too many instances where a contractor will put use dolphin connectors and it'll set on the floor. And after either a really good washing or a really good floor waxing is usually when you get a service call at like midnight, one o'clock in the morning because the sensor went flat line. Yeah, that's why. I don't, I don't so they dolphins. sell 
They sell gel dolphins. Do they? I mean, they, I know they have gel in it, but I just I still don't like the fact. I don't know. It's so too much, too open, too much open. The ones they've been using they have gel, and there's like a heat shrink end on the end. Yes, I know the blue ones, right? No, these are white. Different. So, like, I mean, they had enough heat shrink on there. I felt like it kind of grabbed the wire, but like, I'm not a fan of them. Still, I, I don't like the way they got to crimp them because I've seen too many people like pinch down on channel locks and they tear the coating on there, and it's, it's steel underneath there. So exposing whatever they're setting that that dolphin now on. So if it's a case, that guess what? It's going to be shorted out to the case every once in a while. Yeah. So with this store, it had all these problems. And then it had this pesky problem where it liked to blow up PIB boards and COM ports. So this has been going on for a while. I feel like I'm having deja vu. So and I've had this at multiple different stores. So it would blow up the COM ports on the E2. And this isn't just this case controller. It's across multiple different case controllers because of the way that they're internally circuited. It, it could be Dixel, CoreLink. It could be, I mean, hell, even a microthermal one could do it, I'm sure. So the way, the way that it's circuited inside it has to do a lot with it. So what is happening is they are backfeeding voltage onto the comm loop, and they are causing the case controllers to short out and are blowing the, the PIB boards. So this was the main issue. Now, what is happening with this is, is randomly these case controllers do it. And sometimes it'll blow right away. Like you, like a guy put a PAV board in and boom, comm ports poof again. I've seen the, I've seen the little, the termination resistors that are there that you can that you move with a little jumper there. I've seen them, all three of them glow orange as soon as I plugged it in. Yeah, that's, that's what the last one did. So what? <laughs> So, what, do, you truck, do you truck stock PIB boards now? I, I have PIB boards on my truck. <laughs> Get serious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had so many failures here lately with like I, I've, I, I have, I have enough parts in my truck to rebuild the E2. So, and then I have a new one. So. The the way we're the way we're going about this is the, the most important thing is to check AC and DC volts on that comm line before you plug it back in, because yeah. here's the thing, there was a rash of EEVs mm -hmm. that were failing because they were being overdriven or they were being driven too hard or they were hunting too much, and they're wearing out the 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 gear and the pin. It's causing the windings to shorten the EEV. And it's sending 24, anywhere from 9 to 24 volts DC or AC sometimes. I've seen it be both back on the comm line. Oh, yeah. So and you need to check in AC and DC. Go ahead, Brett. No, what I was going to say is it's it's messed up. I, I've seen it go through. I, I've When I first found that, the first store I was ever at, I'm like, it has to be, it has to be on the primary loop. That's what I thought. I was like, it has to be on the primary loop. It's not on the, like the, the sub cases on the land, right? I was like, it can't be. And sure as shit, because I finally ended up finding, because it was, it was a straight up parallel system. So you could tell which line set was the most icy, icy out of the medium type, right? Because we, we knew it wasn't communicating, but they're still going to defrost kind of on their own, right? So we knew whatever one was the worst iced stuff coming back to the rack, we've got to figure that that would be it. So I went to the primary case first, the eight case and sure as shit. I'm like, no, that's, that's working. And then I went down. It was the, it was C case. It was the third case in the lineup. And I couldn't believe that the voltage from the EV went through the land wires all the way up through the 485 and then fried the fucking pit board. I've never, at that point, I had never seen that before. And, yes, and I, it's very strange because it doesn't, it, 50 percent of the 50 to 60 percent of the time it does not fry the other dixel controllers which is weird right well but i said the, it, it's not every time like usually after this happens i usually end up having a string of bad controllers like a few here and there like it's not like just like you'll fix it and you'll have that one co controller that, that's toast that, that did it and usually like a day or two later you'll have another one or two that go offline but like, I've never had it where like they're all toast. Yeah. Have you? 
No, usually it was that one fucking controller and then done. And I, and I agree with you wholeheartedly about the, the overcycling. I mean, typically I find that it's usually on something that's, you know, like a Husman case. I'm not picking on Husman, so please don't take it as that. I, I'm saying the fact that they all have smaller coils, right? They all have smaller coils. Their coil sizes, as far as BTUs on their medium temp, is 2,900 BTUs. Okay, well, guess what? For an electronic expansion valve, Sporlin does not make an SER AAA, which would be the valve that you would use probably for, for a 449 system. You know what I mean? And so they have to put a double A in there. Well, if you do the sizing and typically like on, if it's, if it's sub-cooled, like if it's sub-cooled low temp, that valve is, will start as a one ton valve. But after you, after you do all the correction factors for all the sub it'll be like a ton and an eighth, like or a ton, a ton, no, a ton, like almost a ton and three quarters oversized. So that valve is just sitting there going, when it's trying to control superheat, it's going from zero to hundred, zero to hundred and just back and forth because it can't find a sweet spot. Cause what does a valve do when it is oversized, right? And when a valve's oversized, it's going to hunt. So well, go ahead. And it makes it worse because most of these case controllers are controlling off of discharge air temperature and not just superheat. And there's no electronic EPRs or EPRs to maintain that case temp. So what ends up happening more, you end up cycling even more trying to maintain discharge air temperature because now is that your superheat may still be high, but your case temperature is 31 degrees. You got these super efficient coils now and you're running like a plus 18 on a rack and say you need a plus 33 degree discharge air and you're running plus 18 at the, at the coil. Now you're, now your coil TD is all off and you're getting your discharge air way, way easier. I mean, cause you have that, you have that big TD there. So, I mean, that, that, that's the other caveat to the case controllers were the, which is causing the early failures. Well, yeah, if the, if the coils were more loaded up, for example, we had, we had a system that, that was having a really hard time maintaining, maintaining a straight load. Like it would constantly short cycle. There was an unloader on it and it didn't matter what we did. Whenever this one system would finally settle out after a defrost, it was such a little load. Cause you had, yeah, you had, I don't know, let's just say 25 evaporators, small Husman evaporators in this whole lineup, right? Well, they all have oversized, oversized expansion valves. So finally the suction pressure is way too low for the system. So what's the, what are they going to do? They're going to clamp down to damn near 0%. When that happens, the load of that much case is going to drop off and then cause your systems to just keep cycling off and on and just kill your compressor. So we actually ended up doing as we took that biggest load and put an EPR on there because we had to still maintain, as you said, the plus 18 for the lowest SST case on that, on that system, which happened to be the meat box. But these cases need like a 26 or a 27 degree coil, depending on what their discharge air is. Cause usually those, those molten dip cases have like a four degree or a three degree TD at this point, cause they're so efficient. So in turn, we put an eva evaporator pressure regulator on there, loaded up the, all the expansion valves, all freaking, let's just say 25 of them up to eight or 15% constantly while the system is running. Then when the system shuts off, then it's that whole load shuts off. So they, you know, the rack's not sitting there fucking short cycling back and forth because these case are calling. Now they're not case are calling. Now they're not. So now we just raise the suction, the saturated suction, and that set of lineup of cases cause those expansion valves to load up more, which essentially caused a happier rack because when we weren't shutting off and on constantly. So that is my biggest complaint about case controllers is the EPR gets left out every time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's vital and it just causes it to run like absolute dog shit. Well, and that's why I think, and not every single one does this, but I think the, the EPR should be just straight, the electronic EPR. Cause I mean, there's some case controllers out there that can do electronic expansion valve and EPR. If they can, why are we not just controlling that suction pressure off of fucking pressure? That's all we should well, be controlling. Because you're, you're changing the, ver one of the variables. I mean. You're already you're already measuring two different variables, such as superheat. Now that variables change has two variables changing inside of it. It's not just outlet line temp. It's now got the suction pressure variable changing at the same time. So that valve is 
trying to hunt and react and you could put all the PID in the world you want in that. But when you have, when your variables are rapidly changing like that, I mean, there's no PID tuning in the world that's going to fix that. I understand that. But if you, if you have it, if you had it on like a, like a Sporlin pressure control, like they use for the, the holdback valve or the, the receiver repressurization valve, you can use it for a fucking EPR control. You set it for that suction pressure, it'll hold. What I'm saying is, is have two separate controls. So we don't have that co-mingling of EPR and electronic expansion valve oh. control. Let the fucking expansion valve control the superheat. Yep. Okay. Let the fucking such a pressure control control the fucking EPR. And then everything will be right with the world. So when the thing actually finally shuts down during defrost, then whatever, it doesn't really matter. But like no, having I, those two interfere with each other is a bitch. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's nice because it'll interface and do both. I mean, it, it'll do both. You could do an electronic EPR on an XM controller, but it's either one or the other. So, but here, here's the issue, guys, is, is that's what's causing these valves to wear out prematurely. And like Brett said, the easiest way to find this usually is to walk around and figure out what case is iced up because it's probably iced up first. You and now, won't. go ahead. No, I was going to say is you won't fucking know because your whole store at that problem at that point is going to be in comm failure. So that's, that's the kind of a bitch about this. That's why I said I had to go and look for what case was iced up because I got to figure out which one that is first. That's the first thing we need to identify the problem case so we can disconnect that one from, from the whole comm loop so we don't have those things. So now this, in this particular situation, this case was not iced up. Really? Well, it was a little bit different. So what it was doing, it was putting 12 volts DC mm -hmm. back on the comm loop. Mm-hmm. And it was, it is shorted out the PIB board mm -hmm. and it was putting 12 volts DC back. So what I end up having to do is the same method I do when it comes to any troubleshooting thing with, with the comm. I start at the beginning, mm -hmm. I check E2, check it there. I go like half the cases in, in the middle, mm -hmm. split the loop in the middle, split the loop apart. Okay. It's this, Here's this. Go ahead. Are, you, are you talking about when it's right, when you have two sets of comm loops right at the E2, where the E2 would then be, or the E3, whatever is going to be the start of the loop? So I'll, 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 I'll do it there first. I'll check the E2, then okay. I'll check the comm loops. Okay. Mm -hmm. That way I know, okay, if it's only one comm loop, it is what it is. Like I'm going to verify it, see if it has voltage there, yada, yada, yada. But if it's two, I'm going to check which one it is. That way I know, okay, I go comm loop A or comm loop B. I'm not going to waste my time on comm loop B. If it's good, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole of comm loop A. If, it, if the voltages are messed up or not what they should be. So if it's all off, then I'm going to head down that rabbit hole. Now you should have, it's roughly mod bus stuff. It's, it's usually about two left to shit center. I mean, I'm sorry, left or I'm sorry. Negative to shield is usually like two volts. Positive to shield is usually two Point one is what I see in the field. I think and they, they usually say 2.2 to 2.3, but I usually see it at like 2.1. It's so it's it's weird with everything. So like they're on the E2 board says some of the documents say like 2.4, 2.6, but it, and it also depends if you have a terminator or not. Yes. So it really matters at that. Now, as you're going through this, so I'll go directly in the middle of the, the comm loop. I'll find the case in the middle of the comm loop. Split it apart. Okay. I'll check the side going back towards the E2 and I'll check the side going back towards the other cases. Okay. Whatever side the voltage is jacked on is the side I'm going to continue on. And then just keep splitting the comm loop until I isolate that, that problem into the, into that one section. And then I'll troubleshoot it backwards from there. So this one was kind of weird though, because it was putting, so if you threw your meter on there, it was like 12 to 13 volts DC from negative to shield. Now, if you left your meter on there, after about 10, 15 seconds, it was down to three volts. You take your meter back off, it was like it was just like ghost voltage on there. So it had to keep going. We ended up finding a case controller. And of course, it was all one of the cases where you got to take nine million screws out of the kick plate and the bumper guards off. And, you know, the case controller buried up underneath. 
and they're all Phillips head screws and somebody's already taken them off and nicely stripped them out for you. So that's really, yeah. that's really descriptive. Like you've seen that like that before. Yeah. Like I just like sitting there just and I think my life taking that thing apart. But so we're after where I was identifying it, we pulled it the, the off that com loop. We pulled that case off and I thought for sure it's on the RS-485 side. Okay, yeah, we're going to, it's going to be it's going to be the lead case. It's going to be the A, like Brett said. No, it's not. It was the it was the second one in the LAN. So it was backfeeding voltage through the LAN, through the A case, onto the RS-485. So I want to say something. So making sure that you actually have a bad PIB board is kind of important. So sometimes what can happen when, when usually when what he's des describing happens, it usually always takes out the, takes out the PIB board. But what, I, what I'm getting at is, is there are some instances where it might shut down the voltage to the COM port, just that one. So I have had instances where you had wires pinched in between some people, they use metal chases for their piping. And they just throw the comm wire in there and not have it supported from the top. So it sits there for a while and just sits on the edge of that, of that jacketing and then cuts through. And sometimes if you have a short, it will shut down the comm port. But it's a lot of times if you turn it off and turn the E2 off and turn it back on, the voltage will come back. If the voltage does not come back, then you probably have a, a situation like, like Kev does. So anytime I see it over 10 volts, they DC or AC, the comm port's trashed. Like Ten. it must be... Yeah, any any time well, it's over. No, I'm saying when you have it unplugged. If you have it unplugged, you put another Molex plug right there, and no, just with no wire, it shouldn't be any, doing shit. Anytime, like there's like say at the wire, there's ten volts or more at the at the at the wire. Yeah, it, it was on there where the problem existed. Anytime it's higher than ten volts, I've never seen one come back for it. Like yeah. power cycle one, like you said, like it did. But if it's like. If you get like some random like five volts on there, usually yeah. you, you can shut the PIB board down, like you said, and it'll come back. But it seems like if it's over 10 volts, there must be some kind of voltage arresters in there or something like that's that's popping to save the E2. Well, I mean, no, when you think about it, the resistors are made for the voltage that's that's supplied, right? So if the voltage supplied coming out is 2.6, those the resistors have to be X resistant so it doesn't burn the freaking thing up. So what's happening is voltage is higher. And it's just killing everything. Yeah. So what we actually found on these Dixels, I, I've never actually taken one of these apart. I've never actually had the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So what we were doing, because you couldn't pull the whole case controller tray out because the manufacturer was what, so nice to leave us to where you couldn't even get the case controller tray out because the wires were too short. So yeah, um, no, would that be the electrician though? Or you're yeah. talking about, oh, you're yeah. talking about the prefab like, wires that are in the control. The light wires, the... Yeah, so they was so nice to leave it like that. You have to make it look pretty, Kevin. Yeah, I I had to cut it and put spades there to get it out like an extension cord almost. So when we pulled it apart, there was there's two little tits on the side of the case controller you push in, and you could pull it off. There is three little, they look like capacitors or like a little. Hold on, hold on. There, there are there they have two leads on the bottom and one at the top. No, they're 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 molded and sealed. So it's like it's in the bottom right hand corner. There's like three little like capacitor looking resistors. Those are burned up on every single one of them that we had problems with. Really? Yes. Every single like, there was a pile of them in the rack room that had failed. That's and that every picture, that's that picture you sent me, right? Yes. Today's episode is sponsored by the RefRush Shield RDP Series Differential Pressure Monitors from Westermeyer Industries, now available for transcritical CO2 systems in addition to other common pressures and refrigerants. When the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Wait too long to replace, and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout. But replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The RDP series differential pressure monitors, including the new transcritical CO2 model, are available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyerin.com. That's W-E-S-T-E-R-M-E-Y-E-R-I-N-T-C-O-M. Mm -hmm. so every single one of them was burned up. And that's what was causing the issue. 
Now, this store had issues with rolling com losses with mm-hmm. the Dixel. And generally, when I see that, it's two things. Either the land wiring is wrong, meaning mm-hmm. like they're all wired for RS-45, mm-hmm. and they're not land wired. Or B, you have uh, to say you have too many devices on one network, which this is. This How many is, are, are you allowed to have? 30? 30 yes. lines? So I think it's 30. But here's the problem. Anytime there's over 25, it's loaded up and you start getting transmission issues. Is that is that what you're talking about where the where it fucking like literally flat lines? Yes. So I've had this discussion with someone re- recently, a young kid, horrible, horrible mustache. He just has a mustache. He look he looks like he should belong in a white van selling candy. But he uh, he had just mentioned this to me. I think freaking two days ago. He's been in arguments and he was kind of bitching about the whole limit thing. How many how many on the loop? How many are there? And he got the typical responses. Well, that's the way we do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the fact that the so they get a lot of the service calls because it EMS flatlines, right? So it might flatline during a certain part during defrost. Let's just say flatlines keeping that temperature and then call, calling them in, they get in, no fucking problem because it's fucking flatline. So we've been having this problem all right, at, at a store. You can have that later. So Jake, <laughs> Jake was dealing with this, and it's been a nonstop issue with the SC3s going offline. It, you, they go offline for like a minute, mm-hmm. and they, or they, the data gets stale and they flatline. Now, there's 35 control 30 to 35 controllers per com loop and come to find out like like me and him we're going back and forth about this like it's overloaded it's overloading the heat and it just can't handle it we'll come to find out now supposedly it's backpedaled to 20 mm-hmm. which or sense because when a store was running only like 15 or 20 the com loop was fast and had no issues as soon as it got to 30 to 35 it started bogging down the com loop and then we started getting rolling com losses okay so my thing is i think these all these com loops are overloaded and that that's what's causing the flat lining in the on the mod bus in the back net side what are you doing you get a picture. So that's what, what what's causing like the rolling com losses on on that stuff, and it's the the wiring. You think that you think the the baud rate could be another problem, like not not u- utilizing it to the full capability of those case controllers. We're having it at nineteen two instead of ninety six. I speed. I fought that fight and nobody. So like at Aldi, we run them at we run them at night at nineteen two, and they run awesome. They're fast. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. I, I, like, I don't understand it. I, I mean, unless I don't understand, unless I'm stupid, I don't understand something, but what I'm, what I'm like, I don't, I don't get why that's even a, an issue. Like I, if you don't believe that's what it is, let's just try it. Like if you have a store that's totally jacked, that's doing stupid shit, like as far as the flatline shit, just, it, 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 you got to do what? Go around all the case controllers. Yeah. You got to change, you know, the, the, the address of the case controllers. Yeah, I mean, it takes like, like a minute to up the baud rate and then just... And just try it. And if it doesn't fucking work, then egg on my face, I'm an asshole, it didn't work. But if it does work... See, it, of... in Aldi, we have zero problems, but there's only like 15 case controllers. Yeah. And it, it it's fast. So, and then 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 you throw in CoreLink into the mix. So that's why I think the 9600 comes from is because most of the time they're on the, the same loops as Corlink controllers. And yeah, for but... some reason since the beginning has been like beating their chest about like 9600. Yeah, but they have the capability. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different product. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 software, right? I and mean, I'm pretty sure the, the shit's configured. I, I don't got I don't know. I don't want to talk shit because I, I don't remember. I don't I don't remember if it's, it's all configurable. No, it's, it's all configurable. It's all configurable. You could change it to nineteen two. All the all these are so, running nineteen. That's what I'm saying. Just fucking try it. Like if it doesn't work, then whatever. But 
I mean, at least give it a shot. It's worse than having dumb service calls. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, how, I don't know how many service calls I've taken for like, even even at Walmart for stale data. Yeah. Stale data. Stale data. But like, it's that that's that's this rolling com loss that's happening on these E2s, and that that's where you're going to see. The other thing is, which I've seen a lot lately, is people running com lines next to conduit you There's, do not what's wrong with that it's a good place to strap it to it right well i'm talking like they have like pull rings in joking. line with conduit i was totally joking mm-hmm. oh in case, like nobody knows this you could actually induce voltage on the com lines and your temp sensor wires or whatever wire shield the cable you're running through there you can induce voltage running it next to 460 or 208 so we had this problem at a store. We kept blowing up EPRs and valve drivers. And come to find out, when they ran the wire for the stepper motor in the mm-hmm. case, mm-hmm. they strapped it to the 460 line going to the rack. And it ran all the way across the, the front of the store to the, the electrical room. Well, this case happened to be outside of the electrical room. And it was strapped to it. It was picking up voltage. And at times it would induce like 41 volts on on the onto the stepper motor, That's and it awesome. was shorting out the stepper motor and shorting out the ESR boards. That's amazing. So hey, it's another thing, guys. Do not strap EMS wire to conduit. Like even 120 volt conduit, don't strap it to it. Like strap it somewhere else. Like it, it, there's going to be times on top of cases you, you, where you have no choice but to run in line with it. But yeah. like try to separate it a little bit, and then that's where grounding your shields is important. Yeah, I, w- I was gonna say, yeah, you can strap it to fire lines, but I, w- I was joking and, and don't. I do swear that. God, I seen that the other day. <laughs> I, I I was in the store and yeah. the data guys, like straight up, were strapped to the fire lines, and I'm not talking like one or two cables. I'm talking like a bundle of like seventy five cables. So I, I when I when I first did my my big boy my first big boy job where I did the whole, whole EMS job I, I I was so scared that I was gonna fuck something up so I, like I bought how to hang how to hang communication and data cable book and like literally I spent a week going through that book it's a it's a very it's a very picture book like it looks like an elementary book like there's people walking around and stuff like what not to do and stuff it's a great book. And it taught me a shit done, but like I was, that's what I was, the stuff I was afraid of. Like, am I allowed to free hang? What's the rules? Well, it's anything under 50, 50 volts, right? When you go through a wall, what do you have to do? Well, you have to run it through a sleeve and then you have to put fire caulk in between there. And there's all kinds of other rules that you have to make sure. But then on top of it, you have everyone that's listening has to deal with that stuff in correlation with other people not hanging the wire correctly and not doing it correctly and just, just having a real bad time with it. Yeah, I mean, I see more com issues, honestly, from from people not trimming wires out properly, not shielding them properly, or not terminating them properly. Because here's the other thing, like, when I go, like, with case controllers, if I'm doing them in box to box, taping the ends where the, where, the, where the wires, after I cut them with a pair of scissors, I tape the ends, mm-hmm. I take them together, I fucking for the dixels this is very important Mm -hmm. i take the shields together i twist them together i wrap them around the wires i take electrical tape and insulate the shields at this particular job every single shield was just wrapped around a wire three of them i found were touching voltage so you don't want the shields to be exposed the shields need to be wrapped around a wire and they need to be cleaned up now, if you're in a if you're in a like a case where they they're actually using the shields and the case controllers, but they actually land. I mean, me personally, I take electrical tape and I tape the the shield. Well, you got to watch now too, because like they don't in some of the case controllers, they don't even want you connecting the ground to the controller itself. Correct. It it, it, it it's I don't know. Comms are fine. Like calm work is is a real weird thing because I mean you could have one week where. You've been wiring all this stuff up the same way while you've been told. And then all of a sudden, one week, it's like, nope, I'm not going to work that way. The line resistor was the prime example. Like, remember how, how many times the, the end of the line loop the, has changed for the XM controllers? 
Well, that's, right. that's, that's my point. So it was a resistor, then it was grounded, then it was another resistor, then it was not. And then like, I just looked at the one the other day and it had nothing. It just Wait, showed what? the, yeah, it just showed the end of the loop right off. So I was in the midst of making a presentation. I'm trying, I'm just, I was looking at that, like, oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. No, all, the only resistor they have at the start of the column loop, like, so at the E2 or E3, they have a hundred watt. I'm sorry, 100 ohm, half a watt resistor that goes directly from the shield directly to ground, does not get hooked up to the E2 at all. Yep. And then at the, the termination block gets put in right before the, the last primary controller. So if you have one, two, three, if you have four case lineups through all three cases, you know, it's going to start at the first case, let's say A and then B and then C and then D, but it's not getting terminated on the land. It's just getting terminated on the straight 45 termination oh. block goes there and then the other ones don't need a term the last xm one i just looked at on monday mm -hmm. showed nothing for the lead in term it showed nope. the, it showed the 100 watt resistor at the e2 but nothing on the end no term block on the end where where, where how or how new like it, i just i just googled it like on monday like it was the first emerson doc that pulled up really what showed nothing on there but it changed it changes all the time well i believe you because I, I mean i've looked at it. that's the two one yeah yeah that, that's or no the 670 the 679 one this is this came out of the one of the newest 679 guides yeah so this was a 678 so it's the same yeah. fucking thing did you so this was bipolar steppers then right yeah. okay because yeah. just so you're aware and i, I only found this out because i was i had a XM controller in my hand, we were talking about it in class and, and I looked down and I didn't realize the pulse width ones actually have a jumper that you have to move, whether it's 24 volt supplying the pulsing solenoid or the 120, 230. There's a certain way that that solenoid has to go. So another thing or you guys, the jumper, sorry, is like Hill has been using a bunch of 24 volt XM controllers and running 24 volt pulse valves. Oh, wow. I, I found this out when we lost a case controller and I had an XM679 in my truck with the jumper and I went to go change it out. And I'm like, looking at it, and I'm like, what the hell? Like, is it smoke? I go, no, I, I look at it before. I'm like, why is this got a 24 volt transformer on it? Yeah. And I look, it's 24 volts. Mm -hmm. So evidently, they met either something changed in the supply chain, they, they, they couldn't get the, the 120 or 208 ones. Or what? But that that was that was still an issue. Now, I've never usually when the the pulse valve the six seventy nines pop when they short, it usually just blows the the SCR inside the pulse valve or driver. But it usually doesn't. I've never seen it back feed and put one hundred twenty on a com loop. So I haven't seen it. I don't think it has the ability to do that. But that that that's a issue with the bipolar stepper motors. It, it probably because it uses probably just a solid state. Solid state fucking relay because I mean it, because it's pulse width you can't use a regular conventional relay you yep. could but you got to remember like a regular conventional mechanical relay that would control like your defrost your lights even your fans that is a physical spring and, and contacts whatever when you're dealing with the pulse valve they do a solid state so there's no moving parts and the reason for that is is because a typical relay might have a cycle a life cycle of a hundred thousand cycles maybe I, I I don't know what it is but I'm, let's, we're just gonna Imagine it's a hundred thousand cycles where a pulse width or like almost like cycling for any sweats, the anti sweat pulsing board that that can pulse up to a million times. And still it, it, that might be the lifespan of that. So that expansion valve would have to pulse a million times before that solid state set of relays would say, I'm not working anymore. Yeah. I mean, it is it, the duty cycle on it is triple or double what a normal conventional relay would be. You just said duty. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's why they're using solid state relays for that. I mean, I haven't seen one of those back feed, but like at the end of the thing, like when you're troubleshooting comm issues like this, mm -hmm. you're, you're in a store like this, don't expect to like you know, the first try, you're probably not going to find it. I mean, and the other thing is just don't stop at the first lineup you find where you find the issue, start looking through stuff. Cause if you start seeing land, I see the, the land miswiring on like half the stores I go to. So do you start 
if you're entering a store and it's had problems for, for a long while, what's the first thing you attack? I, I start with the comm loop to make sure the wires are ran to where the fuck they need to be first. Well, so I'm going to tell you right now, like all those comm loop drawings and all these stores are all effed because here's the problem. And like, I understand why it happens now, but it needs to have like a drawing remade because we're doing all these remodels. Okay. They have this, this whole comm drawing. Mm -hmm. We don't get the cases in, in the way that the comm drawing says we get the cases on whatever shows up. So they may have you starting with like that. That's where the whole S SE three thing at Walmart became a problem because it, it shows you starting at your first case is a O two. Okay. Well, we're getting a seven first. A two is back ordered. I mean, I, 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 I get what you're saying, but I mean, you have enough wire you could lay. I mean, if, if the prep was done properly, you could freaking just spool a whole shit ton of wire and just bypass a O one run it to AO7, and then you could slice off pieces of fucking wire. Okay, the AO1 lands here. Okay, well, I can straighten that out, right. temp that out. and Who pays for that? That's, that's, it's not, it's not as simple as you think it is. It's, it, that's a lot of labor involved. And it's not just splicing here and there. Like, you're talking cases on the other opposite sides of stores. Well, I mean, that, 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 that's where it becomes a problem. And, they, it's the way these remodel schedules are set up. Like if you want to have a com drawing and that, and that that's great. And I, and that's how it should be. But like, then the remodel schedule needs to follow that because now, now, now you're, now you're getting into doing work two to three times over. Okay. Fair enough. Because th that that's where the issue comes in. Now, like if we do that, like I'm making my guys make a com drawing. Like I'm fixing the com drawing. This goes here. This goes here. This I, I'm making my own com drawing, just like I do on the when I do my retrofits. I make a com drawing. It goes this board, this board, this board, this board. But like that, that's that's part of the issue. Is like these stores are getting remodeled, and it it, it wasn't a problem until COVID hit, and then it was just whatever case they could get. Yeah, well, it's going to force manufacturers to start shopping elsewhere, right? I, I would just ordered analog output modules from Danfoss. I'm not getting them until July. I, I have lots. Of them. It didn't show up till noon. Sweet. So it's like, then Thursday, the case didn't even show. So... I mean that that that's that's what you deal with 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 that. But like, I mean, in this case, like, is making sure you you have the right com loop, and then making sure where it actually goes where it's supposed to go, is mm -hmm. is deal. And then, if you are troubleshooting this and you are figuring out as you go, make a com dr drawing for the next guy. Make it if it, if the com drawing that they have, if they even have one. If it isn't right, make your own com drawing as you go and start marketing it and start marketing the, the wires to and from as you're troubleshooting it. Like this goes to case AO1, this goes to AO1B, this goes to AO7 next. You know, start marketing it out as you go so you can troubleshoot that easier. And then as I'm going, I'm fixing stuff. As I see, like if I see stuff rubbing through or if I see like land stuff wired wrong, like fix the land stuff as you're going. It's not causing your immediate issue, but it's causing compounding issues later on. It's putting more traffic on the network and everything else. That A case makes a lot of decisions for the other cases. Now, all those cases are bogged down. And if they're not wired for the LAN, they won't start a defrost at the same time if they go down. Meaning like, so if the com loop goes down, all those cases run a standalone mode. But if they're not wired in LAN, so if it's mm -hmm. A1, A, B, C, and D, all those cases start defrosting at different times. They start doing whatever they want. So they're in a lineup when they're wired through the land. Case A starts, says, oh, we're going to sync defrost times. We're going to sync defrost times across A, B, C, and D because it's on my land. And mm. then it's going to shut those off. Those cases will run in standalone mode while you're in you're this com loss. Mm. Well, if they're not wired like that, it's not going to function like that. Yeah. We were going to talk about wiring, wiring issues or how to, how to start stepping through that. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. 
So one of, one of the things, as we discussed a couple of times, there's voltage on that comm line, right? So we have to make sure that the board's putting out said voltage. And sometimes when it's not, it's because it could be because another controller is, is shorting everything out because well, let's say you have a case controller could have a bad pressure transducer, tr pressure transducer pulls the voltage from the analog out or analog input, which essentially pulls the voltage down, causes a, a comm issue. To check if you if you do have any suspicions about the wire, this is one one thing that you could do. It's kind of labor intensive, but if you're at a so you're at that point where you've kind of checked everything out and you're not coming up with anything, this is another route to do that. So you'd have to find out where your comm loop goes and pull the comm wire off of the gauge controller. Because essentially what we're going to be doing right now is is measuring the resistance both ways, opened and shorted. So you, you pull every single comm line off of the off the gauge controller, pull the molex plug off. So it's just waving in the air. You start from all the way at the end and start measuring from where the the shield and the positive would be, the shield and the negative and the positive to negative. We're measuring that first to make sure we have nothing short. And then what you can do is is go backwards from there. And you should increase by like, depends on how long the wire is, anywhere from four to eight ohms every time you go to the next gauge controller. What that is, is just measuring the resistance of the wire. The reason why this is good, it checks all the integrity of the actual wire that's connected into the case controller itself. So if you get to one point where you got 32 ohms from shield to positive, but I have like 82 on the other one, well, guess what? There Maybe there may have a bad connection. Maybe it's pinched within that bit piece of wire causing that. The other thing that we can do is like short the ends where you're actually measuring for anything pinched together because it should be, I'm sorry, it should read open. It should read open all the time if you're going from shield to positive and shield to negative. If you do get resistance there before shorting the three ends together, then you have some sort of wire that's close and that's short. And you can, you can the closer you go one way or another, you'll measure that on your meter. And you can do the same thing with, how I goofed it up before we tiled the three ends together, the shield, the positive, the negative, while nothing's connected to the case controller and just keep going backwards from the end of the loop. And they should increase because of the same wire distance between each case. So it should just gently increase from point A to point B until you get back all the way up to where you're going up to the E2 or whatever. No, that's a good way to check it. Just like uh, omen it out. Like there's been times like I'll, if I'm omen it out, like I'll use a resistor. And put it on there and make sure that like my resistance is what the resistor should be. So well, that's, that's, what's good. Cause you leave that termination resistor on there. So you have that certain resistance, but like I said, you also want to make sure there's no shorts, right? Cause it could be dropping the voltage because of that, or it could be dropping the voltage because of the, some, some kind of input on the, on the controller, typically a pressure transducer, something that takes voltage could be drawing that thing all the way down. Have you ever seen anything else tied to an XM controller other than a pressure transducer that actually draws voltage. I'm just, I'm thinking, I don't think I ever have. I think it's usually just a pressure transducer and three or four temperature sensors. Yeah. I mean, usually it's just that I know you could possibly have a humidity sensor because you could have a, you could have a random input on there. Like it's a, you have any, any sort of control. Yeah. So you, I, you have that random input you could have there. It could be dragging everything down. So, I mean, also some of those other inputs are powered too. So like the door switch that, that even though it's a dry contact, it still has five volts going through it. Hmm. So that could still be, you could still short out a temp sensor and, and still cause that five volts to drop too. So that's another thing. And then. I mean, you went over the wiring pretty good. You want to go over anything else? No, I think we covered it. I think we bored them enough. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Till next time. Have a good night.